Now it's my turn to present to you. First, just a little bit of background about myself. So I've been a journalist for 20 years. I've worked for Leader Newspapers, Win TV, 3AW, Channel 7, and currently I'm at the ABC. So during the 10 years I was at 3AW, I was their police reporter. So if there was a major breaking story, I would be sent there to report on it. Uh, today, I'm going to share with you my experiences reporting on the Pike River coal mine disaster for 3AW, and then give you my advice on how to handle the media at a major incident. So let's just recap what happened. In November 2010, there was an explosion at the coal mine located in Greymouth on New Zealand's South Island. 29 miners were killed. At the time of the explosion, there were 31 people below the ground. Two miners survived, but the remainder were trapped for at least one and a half kilometres from the mine's main entrance. So a major rescue operation began, but sadly, subsequent explosions the following week ended any hope of finding any survivors. I spent two weeks in Greymouth reporting on the tragedy, and now I'm going to share with you a short uh, audio clip from when I reported on news of the second blast. It's been revealed all 29 miners in the New Zealand mine explosion are dead. Yvette Gray is in Greymouth, where the miners' families have just been told. Look, what I can tell you is uh, word is coming through that there's been a second blast at the Pike River coal mine and there's no hope of finding any survivors. Now I'm standing outside the local council offices here where the family have just been told this terrible news. And what I can see are family members inconsolable. They're, they're in tears, they're hugging each other, they're walking out. Um, there's a large media contingent outside. The press conference was due to start in about 10 minutes, but all the media have run out of there and we're all here um, obviously waiting for any further news, but uh, yeah, look, it seems to be a very tragic situation. Police Superintendent Gary Knoll says the second explosion happened a short time ago. It was extremely severe and based on the expert evidence that I've been given who, and the men who were present, based on the rescue teams who were with me, it is our belief that, little, that no one has survived and everyone will be, have perished. This was, was the most, one of the most tragic things I've had to do as a police officer. So now I want to give you an insight into how I went about reporting on the Pike River coal mine tragedy. Uh, when news broke of the first blast at the mine, I essentially had two hours to pack my suitcase, get to the airport where I boarded a flight to New Zealand. I landed in Christchurch and then drove straight to Greymouth. The first location I went to was the mine site where I had to do live radio crosses using information uh, the newsroom in Melbourne had sourced for me while I was travelling and then paint a picture of what I could see. Now, obviously, by the time I got there, the police had blocked the road into the mine. So there was limited information from the scene. And I ended up spending most of my time speaking to the local community. And what I found was uh, they either had a personal connection with one of the trap miners or knew someone who did. Uh, for example, the lady I stayed with was friends um, with the families of several miners trapped and uh, she was busy cooking food for the families and organising care packages. Um, and just generally when I'm reporting on stories um, like this, I tend to find that anyone who works in a town centre, whether it's the post office, the news agency, the local pub, um, they're always really good to speak to as they're usually well connected to the community and have the most up-to-date information. So as a radio reporter, I was required to file as many for as many news bulletins as possible. Um, this was usually from six o'clock in the morning right through to six o'clock in the evening at the latest, at the, sorry, at least, and they were half hourly uh, deadlines during those breakfast shifts, otherwise hourly. Um, at the same time, I was also doing numerous live uh, crosses into radio programs right across Australia. So every day I was up at four o'clock in the morning preparing my stories and um, usually doing my last cross by 10 o'clock that evening. So each day uh, during the rescue mission, there were two daily press conferences, morning and afternoon, which was my main source of information. Uh, New Zealand Police was the lead agency and provided detailed updates on where they were at with attempting a rescue. Uh, they explained the dangers and hurdles they faced sending in rescue personnel, while the Pike River Coal Mine CEO, Peter Whittle, would talk about the support being offered to families of the miners and answer any questions specific to the mine. The local mayor was also available for interviews and often spoke on behalf of the grieving families. So from my perspective, uh, the New Zealand police and the mine handled the media side of things really well. Um, by having a press conference in the morning and another in the afternoon, it gave reporters updated information to report on, which was especially important for myself um, as a radio reporter because I would need new and different stories um, every hour. 
Also, journalists want to speak to the people who are in charge, who are willing to answer any question and explain things in a clear and concise way. We need the facts to report on and we rely on authorities to provide this information. And it just goes without saying, when there are 29 lives at, at risk, journalists want to be as sensitive as possible in their reports. So having accurate information is extremely important. So this brings me on to my list of the do's and don'ts when dealing with the media at a major incident. Um, I, I'm very aware that there's often a reluctance to speak to the media. Uh, this could be because people are worried that they will be, um, what they say will be taken out of context or they'll be misquoted, or even they might um, consider speaking to the media as uh, too time consuming when there are bigger issues at stake. So I want to explain to you why it is important to have a relationship with the media and how it will ultimately benefit you, particularly during a crisis. So I'm going to give you my top four rules when dealing with the media, using insight, obviously, from a journalist perspective, which I hope will help um, you understand how we operate and what ends up being reported. So rule number one, never stay silent and ignore media requests. Now, I'll tell you what happens if you do. So as a journalist, we're under pressure to go to air or print information on a breaking news story as soon as possible. So we are relying on you to tell us the facts so we can report on it accurately. If we aren't given this, our editors will tell us to source information from elsewhere, which at that point could lead to misinformation being reported. Also, if you ignore us, it looks like you have something to hide and we'll go digging around for any background on your company to report on. This is where you can find yourself facing a major publicity crisis if there is negative information from the past reported. So by being forthcoming with information, you essentially have more control with what is being reported. I would recommend releasing a short statement initially if you don't feel comfortable being interviewed or need some more time to investigate. Uh, but from my perspective, a short statement that could be one or two sentences is certainly better than nothing. So that brings me on to rule number two respond to the media in a timely fashion. Now, we understand you may not be able to give us the information straight away, but we do expect to have something within a couple of hours of a breaking story. Journalists work to deadlines, often half hourly or hourly bulletins, so the sooner you respond, the better it will be for you in ensuring your key messages are heard. The news cycle doesn't stop, especially when it's a major breaking story. Now, while we are waiting for your response, media could be uh, publishing things like, the company has not responded, the company has not returned calls, or even the company refused to comment. Really, it just depends on the scenario. But either way, it doesn't look good if you wait too long to respond. So at the very least, let the journalists know you are working on a response. Just in terms of how you respond, uh, you could hold a press conference, email a statement to media outlets, do a live uh, interview with a radio or TV program, and put a statement on your company website or social media channels. And, and just a tip, when contacting a newsroom, ask for the chief of staff first, um, otherwise an editor or the journalist direct if you are responding to an individual request. Right, so now rule number three, have a good media spokesperson. Now, I'm sure your company has a protocol when it comes to speaking to the media. Uh, from a journalist perspective, we want the person who is most knowledgeable on the subject and who isn't afraid to answer questions. So this could be a CEO, a leading investigator, a senior manager of some description. We understand the spokesperson will have key points they want to make, but when we ask a difficult question, we don't want to hear no comment. We just want some type of answer. And I just want to give you an example of someone who I believe is quite a good spokesperson, and that is the Victorian Premier, Daniel Andrews. Now, during the second COVID wave, he held a press conference every single day and never left a question from a journalist unanswered. Now, sometimes these press conferences would go for a couple of hours. And just for your background, um, that's very unusual because normally a press conference with a minister would be at the most 30 minutes. And usually there's a media advisor calling for the last question. But obviously in this case, it was a very uh, sensitive situation. But even when Daniel Andrews didn't necessarily have the answers, he would at least give try to give some type of explanation or he'd, he'd be upfront and say, look, I'll look into that matter further and have someone contact you uh, with further information. So I'm not suggesting that you have to do what he did, a record 120 days straight of press conferences. It's really just about ensuring that you have someone who is willing to answer the questions and is across the topic. 
Also, it goes without saying a spokesperson needs to be confident in front of a camera, especially if it's being broadcast live, which tends to be the case most of the time these days. Uh, for example, at the ABC, when I'm sent out on a story, um, our cameraman will have a live view. Now, what that is, it's, it's, a, um, it's a device which sends back the press conference live into our um, newsroom and, and, and the hub at the ABC. And that can then go straight onto our ABC 24 news channel. Um, also, uh, these days, um, it tends to be a lot of live broadcasts going straight onto uh, platforms like uh, face Facebook and Twitter um, for media outlets. So my advice is to always treat a microphone as live and, uh, and, and think that uh, just be aware that you are possibly being fed out live. Um, just another thing, um, I know a lot of media trainers uh, tell you to speak in short news grabs, so five to second um, bites that will end up in the news stories. Um, just from my years of experience, I've found that it's the people who speak more naturally um, that come across better. Just sometimes when um, people try to memorise those short um, you know, attention grabbing um, grabs, um, it can come across as a bit forced. So my advice is um, just try to speak as natural as possible. And that brings me on to my final rule number four, understand and embrace social media. So the biggest change I have noticed in my journalism career is the introduction of online reporting, but even more so the use of social media. Journalists are now cross-platform reporters. We write for TV, radio, and online. Uh, for example, at the ABC, if I'm out on the field reporting um, across all those platforms. I'm also required to take photos on my smartphone and sometimes even videos. Um, and those will um, often end up being on either uh, the ABC online story or one of our social media channels. Um, and even sometimes it can appear in one of the news bulletins. Another noticeable change is now that the general public have become reporters themselves. Um, by this, I mean, they're often the first people at the scene of something um, that's breaking. They're the eyewitnesses there who use their smartphones to film the vision, they pop it on social media, and it often ends up in mainstream news bulletins. In fact, these days, most newsrooms will tend to have a team devoted to trawling through social media, looking for stories or finding anything relevant to a breaking story. And just for your reference, the social media that news outlets tend to monitor and use the most are Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. In fact, uh, Twitter itself has become a tool used to break stories. Now, I've just got an example here. Um, Victoria's Health Department tweets the latest uh, COVID case numbers, COVID tests and vaccination figures around nine o'clock every single day so that both the media and the public get the information at the same time. Uh, previously, this information was released at the uh, daily uh, state government press conferences, but um, they were finding that some people were getting leaked the, uh, the figures um, before it would uh, you know, be officially announced. And, and um, yeah, just to try to um, ensure there's not misinformation out there, um, now they now just put it on Twitter, nine o'clock every single day. Um, I also find journalists are increasingly using their own Twitter accounts to break stories as well. So in this digital age, I think it's really important companies understand the benefits of using social media channels and their website, especially if there is a breaking story. If you want information released to the public quickly, journalists can use this information you publish on social media, such as on the likes of like Twitter, um, only needs to be a couple of sentences. Um, it also gives you extra time to put together a more detailed media response to be released later. Uh, just generally, journalists are happy as long as they've got some new information to report on. Um, now, if you don't use social media channels, I would strongly suggest putting a brief statement on your website. Um, as a journalist, um, when I'm covering a story, one of my first port, uh, port of calls is to actually go straight to a company website to see if there's anything I can use from that. Um, and just a little tip, it's really handy if you have a news and media section as well that is easy to find. So just uh, wrapping up, these are my top four rules when dealing with the media. Um, never stay silent and ignore media requests. Respond to media in a timely fashion. Have a good media spokesperson and understand and embrace social media. Now, there's plenty more I would love to share with you, but I, I really hope that what I've been able to give you today um, with some insight into how the media operates um, and give you a really good understanding of why it's important to respond to media during a major incident. So thank you so much for joining me. In the next session, we've got WorkSafe Victoria's Albert Chamali and Jamie Thompson, who'll be sharing their findings following a review of 20 years of evolving regulatory practice.